our first two astronauts clear from the bio break. Zena Cardman, Mike Fink walking out and getting a look at their rocket arm in arm. It's a tall rocket, so it's hard to actually <laughs> look up that. So you've got to lean back uh, to be able to really see it. You know, it looks like Mike Fink, who's on the right-hand side, has a little more lean. What's interesting about him is he's wearing an upgraded suit called an R2. <laughs> the Xena, let's go, just <laughs> circling her arms, let's just go. <laughs> yeah. But uh, he's wearing an upgraded suit that SpaceX says has more mobility and more flexibility in it. Well, he, he just demonstrated that, Well, I he guess. sure did, didn't oh, he? Oh, no, Xena wasn't going to be outdone. <laughs> No, it's, it's awesome to see them, you know, the excitement, the, the emotions that you feel as you're getting ready to, to do something like launch into space. Astronauts are humans. They feel all those same emotions, and so it's fun to see some of the excitement uh, come out and uh, yeah, on display. Spill over right there on the launch pad because there will be time for things to get serious once they get into the cabin we turn on the launch escape system and start flowing propellants. But right now, just like you said, a nice moment at the base of the launch pad where uh, those emotions spill out. But talking about the suit, Mike Fink is the only one who is wearing, you can contrast his suit with Xena's. It looks exactly the same, but it's constructed differently. It has a circumvential zipper as opposed to a vertical zipper so, as you know, you got into your spacesuit like a onesie. His spacesuit has been upgraded and redesigned and has that circular zipper that allows seven inches of flexibility in the suit so you can adapt it to different body sizes. Whereas the, the suit that you wore and that Xena is wearing and the rest of the crew has to be tailor-made, and there's not much adjustment on those. Yeah, and, and it's also a demanding engineering challenge because it has to be mobile when it's unpressurized, but then when you inflate this, uh, it, you also have to create a volume where you can be inside of this rigidized suit uh, and be in there comfortably for, for hours if need be. Um, and so that's a, that's a challenge to get a suit that does that. And, and so this next generation of suit is designed to, to be able to accommodate that wider range a little easier. It'll be good for the astronauts, more comfortable, more flexible, especially, as you mentioned, when you pressurize it, which I guess it's like a giant, just human-sized balloon. This is a great shot from our flight operations team here at Kennedy. You can see the two crew members, somewhat small, getting ready to enter the crew access arm. And here they come, Commander Zena Cardman and Pilot Mike Fink, getting ready to board Dragon Endeavor. And they are all smiles. Ear to ear grins. It's awesome to see. And what a beautiful vista behind them as you look out at the views of the spaceport. Mike just gave us a... The two guns. <laughs> He's a character. Now, before they get into the spacecraft, uh, some important business uh, at hand here, wanting to make sure that no FOD or foreign object debris goes into the spacecraft. So the two suit technicians and the closeout crew there making sure that they take care of that, as well as this tradition right here, my, uh, Nick. Yeah. Got to sign that wall. That means you're going. And it so does. every crew that's uh, launched off of, uh, you know, commercial crew, Crew Dragon launched off of 39A has been able to sign sign around that NASA meatball. And it, it's little moments like that that connect you with the legacy of the program and make you feel connected in a way where you understand, you know, hey, I'm, uh, I'm taking the next step, uh, and and it, it's an important step. There's a lot of people that got me to the point where I can take this step, and hopefully, there's a lot of people coming after me that are going to keep continuing to take steps. Countdown. Crew are in the white room, and this is on schedule. You'll hear these audio callouts from time to time from the crew operations and resource engineer with updates, and we'll pause to listen to them. Here are the two mission specialists now doing their rocket recline, looking up at their ride. I think they studied technique uh, from <laughs> Zena and Mike because uh, they had it down. 
seemed like kind of like a rock and roll kind of pose, didn't it? <laughs> and they will be riding the other elevator. This, of course, is Heritage Space Shuttle equipment. Those elevators, they used to just have numbers in them. And they're headed up to the 275-foot level, so 28 stories high are the crew on the left, all the way up at the top. The crew at the bottom now getting ready to ascend that distance. Uh, SpaceX changed the buttons inside a little while ago to have the top button for 275 say... Space. Space. Yeah. Did you punch it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> I would like to go to space. Can you press uh, space for? Did your uh, your fellow crew member say, "Can can space please? Can you press <laughs> that button for me?" Make everybody wait uncomfortably long. <laughs> that is something you would do. Yeah, uh, maybe. <laughs> so Mike carefully getting into the spacecraft here, which that takes a bit of physical effort, right? You're gonna, you don't want to touch that seal because that is what protects you from the hostile environment of space. Yeah, absolutely. That side hatch is going to stay closed the entire time you're in space. The next time you're going to open that is uh, when you're bobbing around in, in, the, uh, in the Pacific and uh, the recovery teams open it up to get you out. Um, and for of course, we're going to do leak checks on that here in a little bit, Absolutely. and uh, it's important to be able to pass that. So you're you're hyper vigilant about uh, hardware, and you know you mentioned that transition to seriousness uh, as you're walking out that gantry. That's when it, you start to build and, and flip that switch in your mind of okay, this is this is spaceflight hardware. This is the equipment that's going to keep me alive. Uh, you, you become that hyper-vigilant person that you need to be. Mm. Last two crew members there, the mission specialists, walking down the crew access arm. And the final two crew members, mission specialists Oleg Platonov and Kamiya Yui, arm in arm, thumbs up, ready to go. Split screen there, looking outside and inside the white room. You mentioned the mission. This crew is leaving the ground with a baseline of at least six months, half a year in space, ladies and gentlemen. But they are being considered and, and research and study and certification process is underway to expand this to an eight-month increment, two months longer. And so the plan is for the commercial crew program, which is here at NASA, is to certify the spacecraft Dragon to be able to support them for a return eight months later. We know they can live on station for eight months. We've had astronauts live there for a year. Mm -hmm. um, but that is a long-duration space flight. And so the hope is that they certify them for eight months and they can return eight months later, hoping to get it by October. Yeah, you know, it's a sixth flight of Endeavor, and there's a lot of things that need to be looked into. Uh, if you, from a crew perspective, you know, the mindset has to be, I'm, I'm going for eight months. And uh, and then if it ends up not turning out that way, then uh, then that's a I guess a pleasant surprise or uh, unfortunate, depending on your perspective depending at the moment. Because <laughs> uh, every day in space is a gift, um, and uh, no, it'll 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 be exciting for them. And like you said, we've had people up there. You know, one of my crew members, uh, Christina Cook, was up there a year. Uh, you know, she launched with me on MS-12, um, so we know how to do it. And we know how to keep people healthy when they stay up there that long. Uh, it's, it really comes down to expectations 
and, and expectation management with crew members as well as families, as well as the entire team that has to support this particular mission uh, because it's not just the crew and their families, but that entire support network uh, is on call while they're on, on orbit. That's an interesting point to think about. I hadn't thought about uh, just how that kind of puts the family, as you mentioned, on call as they're that entire time. They, they have the moments where they get to connect with you via mm -hmm. video, phone, and uh, high-speed connection, but uh, you're as long as you're up there, that... Uh, they know that you're not here on Earth. You're in space, yeah. and you're, you're, you and your crew are being supported by this international laboratory, which has been doing it for 25 years come November 2nd. You're watching live launch coverage of NASA and SpaceX's Crew-11 launch to the International Space Station. I'm Daryl Nail, and I'm joined by NASA astronaut and Brigadier General Nick Haig. We've counted down about an hour and 20 minutes so far. And we're cruising to liftoff. T minus two hours and 44 minutes. T zero is 12.09 p.m. Eastern time. 